Hello, I am Ben Calcaterra, and I am here with Garth Reynolds, and we are here to bring you the first episode of Illinois Farm Talk, brought to you by the Illinois Pharmacists Association. Hello, Garth. Hello, Ben. We've had a pretty busy week in the state, haven't we? Very busy. It's uh, been kind of wild and crazy and exciting to listen to everything that's been going on and moving. Uh, We've had two bills that were debated on the House floor this week. Uh, Tell me about the House Bill 274. As you know, it's increasing the access to hormonal contraception, and they debated on the floor of the House on Wednesday and Friday last week. And currently, it's waiting on a reassignment, but Representative Musman tested the waters. Although we have a comfortable margin, I feel like we have a positive margin. Is that how you feel, Garth? That's correct. I mean, as we've um, discussed in uh, uh, previous law updates and through um, other programs through the association, we've talked about House Bill 274 in various forms over the last couple of years. And as we remember, this was a bill that is trying to increase access to contraceptive services through expansion of rights to pharmacists. And if we look at this legislation, it's looking at using a statewide standing order approach and would allow pharmacists to have a provider access ability to be able to assess a patient and being able to provide that medical patient care service. So it's a completely new approach to patient care than what we've been used to in Illinois. So you say that there's going to be an assessment performed. Explain what kind of level of assessment we're talking about a pharmacist is going to provide. So the pharmacist is going to have the patient fill out a self-risk screening assessment, very similar in the same approach that we do with immunization care right now. Now, of course, this questionnaire is going to be more extensive in asking questions about the patient's medical history and looking for contraindications, which would lead the pharmacist in their professional and clinical judgment in referring that patient back to their physician or referring them to a new health care provider because a lot of the women that we're looking to address in this bill currently do not have a health care provider for their women health needs. And that's why we're looking at pharmacists to be able to help fill that gap. So when you're saying that a pharmacist is going to fill the gap that a, a doctor would traditionally fill, I know that when the House is debating this, one of the problems that we're facing is the uh, misconception that a pharmacist is becoming the doctor. So what's, what's the difference here? How, how do we explain as a pharmacist to someone who's listening and trying to understand what we're trying to do? How do we explain to them what the pharmacist is actually doing as a pharmacist service as opposed to becoming the doctor? I think a couple ways we need to look at this first is to explain what a statewide standing order is. I know some of the misconception that was on the House floor debate that this was coming out as an an executive order or directive of public health that all pharmacists must do this and all patients must have this service available. That's completely not what we're looking at here. As we look at the standing order, this would be coming from the chief medical officer for the Illinois Department of Public Health in providing a guideline for how this service would be introduced and performed. So again, as we talked about, the self-screening risk assessment questionnaire, which is using the United States medical eligibility criteria, which is a tested criteria that is developed by the CDC and is used by all healthcare practitioners in deciding what is the best treatment option for contraceptives for patients and being able to bring notice to those contraindications which need further examination. And I know one of the aspects that also came up in the House debate was that, well, doesn't this need a physical examination? And no, it doesn't. Um, if For those patients who do need a physical examination for possibly their specific health care condition or their um, method of contraception that they would like, let's take, for instance, an IUD, that patient would need to be seen by a physician or a nurse practitioner or other women's health care practitioner who could perform that service. What we're trying to address here with pharmacists stepping up and helping increase access is looking at the oral dosage form, the the vaginal ring, and the transdermal patch. And with those three forms of contraception, do not require a physical exam to be performed as long as there's no contraindications. And again, if there's contraindications that come up with the risk assessment, then the pharmacist would have to, according to the standing order and according to the guidelines, refer that patient back to a healthcare provider. 
So, you know, for some of those naysayers that don't understand what's really going on, as, as you so aptly uh, described here, it's kind of like a doctor has allowed us to paint by numbers, uh, so to speak, and they're, they're giving us the instructions. We're just following along. We're not becoming them. We're, we're doing what we were trained to do in the order the physician has already given to us, which is, you know, highly the same as the same order that the physician gave when they wrote the prescription in the first place. So I hope this is educated out there to the people on, on the House floor that don't really understand that concept because I think it's a key point, right? It's, it's a key point that we, we have to get them to understand that we are not becoming the doctor. And I think that's, that's where a lot of these uh, folks are, are, are getting the misconception. Do, do you agree? I, I would definitely agree with that. And I think two other points to bring up here is, one, when we're looking at, um, as you said, the paint-by-numbers approach, there was a study done in 2011 or 2012 that was looking at um, how patients are actually better at completing the self-screening risk assessment than physicians had been in the study. So this is a tried and tested tool, and even the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has a position statement that they would like to see the oral dosage form of, of contraception move over the counter. And as we all know, that could take many years before the FDA finally rules on that suggestion. And this just puts a step in where we have a healthcare provider who happens to be the medication education expert as in the pharmacist. And we've been able to already prove not only with how well we can handle standing orders and screening patients with immunization care, but in the way that we're trying to address the statewide standing order, we've been able to show that we're able to execute that efficiently and effectively through the naloxone statewide standing order, which is currently in effect, and the model that we're using for this contraception of service. That's great. So, um, you know, while they were hearing the bill on the floor, there was uh, there, there's been a few changes, right? So the, the original bill that, that has been introduced has changed a few times. And recently, they just passed a second amendment to this bill out of the House Health Care Licenses Committee last Tuesday, actually. So w- w- what did that amendment change? That amendment addressed specifically the payment of services for pharmacists, and this is where we had to um, expend a lot of um, time making sure we get this correct, because this is, as we stated in earlier comments, um, when we brought up the term provider status, because that's really what this is helping to address on a state level, is recognizing that pharmacists provide needed patient care services and are duly, just like any other healthcare provider, should be paid for that that service and that um, professional time spent with the patient. And in doing so with Amendment 2, we were amending the language back from a more general language that we had initially approached to just looking at the contraceptive assessment and the consultation, both under uh, commercial and private insurance and then also looking at it under Medicaid. So Representative Musman wanted to make sure that when we approached this legislation, if, if we get to a completed package, which is what we're hoping to achieve with House Bill 274, that it has both the right for the pharmacist to provide the clinical service and the payment um, language that's going to be needed to be able to pay, reimburse the pharmacist for that time. And where other states had to add that on later on. Colorado just had to go back and take a look at their language. And California had to go back and um, put in some amendments for their Medi-Cal program as well. So we were wanting to try to make sure we had both pieces of the puzzle together as we move forward. So as we were listening to the House debate and, and learning about what's happening and, and the movement that it's getting here, uh, we, we, we did learn that we have done a good job at educating because we've got the numbers on our side. For the most part, as we said earlier, we have a positive margin, although that's not quite a comfortable margin. But uh, it seems like we're doing pretty good there. We, we, we still need a big push. We still need people to, to call and and give us some support to help us make sure that those legislators know that that the people are behind this bill and, and the access is important. Um, do you fully think that we're going to to be able to bring the last handful of legislators on board and get this thing passed? I I really do think we can get this bill passed this session. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the the medication class that we're dealing with. Um, Contraception, regardless of your party affiliation or other cultural or religious beliefs, do bring some additional 
factors to the bill that we may not have if this was a different medication class that we were discussing. And so it has probably given us an increased incline to be able to get this bill to complete passage. But I think we can get there with our numbers. And that's really going to come to our members reaching out, talking with representatives about supporting this bill and looking past the medication and looking at what it's trying to do. We're wanting to be able to achieve with this bill that pharmacists should be recognized to be paid as any other health care provider for the patient care services that we provide, and that we, as any other health care provider, deserve to have that recognition to be able to not only provide this needed contraceptive service, because as we need to remember, over half of all pregnancies in Illinois are considered to be unplanned. And we need to make sure that we are doing all that we can as healthcare providers in assisting our patients in being able to um, have the best preventive um, healthcare options available to them. Well, it is definitely important for pharmacists to get paid for the services that they're doing, and that's something that has been greatly underappreciated for a long time. So I, I really hope that that works out. I think it will. Uh, I think that we've got some great support and great movement behind us and it's going to keep going but speaking of great support and movement there was something else that happened this past week wasn't there uh, yes definitely <laughs> house bill 3479 that that's another big topic that we have uh this is the bill th- that was heard in committee on wednesday and then it was also heard on the floor of the house on thursday and to our pleasant surprise it passed We had no idea that it was going to be called so soon, but it was, and it passed. 3479 is a bill that will change the way the managed care organizations pay pharmacists. The MCOs are now paying for 80% of Medicaid prescriptions in every county across the state as of April 1st. However, those MCOs are paying far less than what regular Medicaid fee-for-service rates were. So let's talk about 3479 then. Garth, what will this do to rectify that problem? What we're wanting to achieve with House Bill 3479 is restructure the reimbursement rates that managed care organizations are currently paying and roll them back so that prescriptions could not be reimbursed or dispensing fees could not be any lower than the established reimbursement rates and dispensing fees under fee-for-service or traditional Medicaid. Now, granted, we're not saying that um, traditional fee-for-service is the golden ticket, but it gets us at a better playing field to to be able to operate our business, to be reimbursed for our products, that we can keep stores open and operational, and make sure that the, the access that is definitely needed throughout the state remains at the current levels. Well, we've got a lot of problems going on right now with this whole structure, don't we? So, you know, the MCOs, they have PBMs that are managing the claims for them. The PBMs are setting the rates. They also own the pharmacies that are our direct competition. So, you know, there's there's a lot of issues that, unfortunately, this particular bill is not going to be able to take care of all the problems that we have in pharmacy right now with this same structure. But what we can do is get this small population of patients that are paid by the MCOs back in track. We've got dispensing fees that were $3.40 uh, on traditional Medicaid, and now they're dropped down to 45 cents, 45 measly cents for our dispensing fees. You know, that, that takes care of all the time that just last year we were mandated to spend to counsel every single patient on every single new prescription. 45 cents doesn't quite cover that kind of time, a lot less cover the professional knowledge that we're passing along. So where do we go from here? Let's say that this bill that just passed out of the House, now it's going to move to the Senate. We're waiting for assignment there. What do we do as far as educating the senators now about dispensing fees and and why it's important? I think we need to help, as we did in the House successfully. The main reason our bill passed is because our members got on the phones, got on email, and educated our representatives along with the information that we were providing them. This bill would not be where it is right now if it wasn't for our members picking up the ball and running with it. And that's what we have to continue to do in the Senate. And the Senate has not been spending near as much time on the Medicaid managed care issue as the House has. And so we may have a 
little bit of a larger lift when it comes to educating our senators on managed Medicaid. So we need to be patient with them as they start to learn how this issue is impacting our practices. Because I know we can get very passionate about what's going on because it's hurting our bottom lines. And we know that that's really causing a lot of operational strain right now with pharmacies. But we have to make sure that we're respectful of what our senators are trying to do and understanding the issue. So we need to take a look at giving them examples of reimbursement rate changes from fee-for-service to managed care. And we've definitely have collected that information and provided a lot of that information on the House side and are reinforcing that now in the Senate. In addition, on the dispensing fees, as you discussed, Ben, we moved from looking at uh, multi-source being reimbursed at $5.50 and single-source being reimbursed at $2.40 to moving to $0.45. The previous dispensing rates were ridiculous to begin with, and we have to move to a professional dispensing fee. And that's one thing to take a quick aside to take a look at what we're trying to ultimately achieve with moving everything back to fee-for-service. Last year, the federal CMS approved a rule uh, called the Covered Outpatient Drug Rule, and that stated that fee-for-service had to be paid by the states at either NADAC or a state MAC list price, plus a professional dispensing fee that had to be based off actual research data not just a political number that's being used for budgetary purposes, which is what we've been used to. Now, Illinois is one of about five states that still have not had their state plan amendment passed. Now, when they do get that passed, the HFS has hinted that they'll be remaining at their state MAC list price, so that doesn't change for us. But the professional dispensing fee will. Current data and reports, specifically one that we've referenced and recommended to HFS that was done by NCPA and NACDS, showed that Illinois should be paid at a professional dispensing fee of $10.66. And we have heard that HFS has been looking at a number closer to $10. Well, I think any, any of us would be elated to go from five fifty and two forty to $10 for a professional dispensing fee. I know I would. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind because at least on the fee-for-service side, those claims have to be retroed back once it's approved back to April 1 of 2017. Now, there won't be any retro effect for any managed Medicaid claims, but that's just a longer goal to keep in mind as we try to move the reimbursement rates back to a reasonable and sustainable level. So not only are we looking for dispensing fees to be raised and the prices to be brought back to regular fee-for-service levels as far as the reimbursement for the product and the payment for the dispensing fee. We also have a small little line in here that I like, and and the line is that we do not have to accept any payments below cost, below our actual acquisition. This is important because in the past, every contract a pharmacy signs has a line that says that we are required to provide that service no matter what the reimbursement is. So if they pay us $20 below cost, we have to accept that claim. We have to let that patient walk out the door with the product and we cannot tell them that it was not accepted. So this is considered breach of contract and they can easily drop a pharmacy off the contract and the entire network just because they don't want us to receive the proper reimbursement that we deserve. So I like the line that we do not have to accept a claim that's below acquisition because this gives a pharmacist, finally, it gives the pharmacist the right to control his own or her own destiny. And they can say no, finally, right? They will, if we can keep the language that we're looking at, not only in the current version of the bill, but making it stronger in some amendment language that we're looking to introduce when it comes into the Senate this week. This is all very important because this allows the pharmacist to have control and they do not have to be forced out of business this way because if 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 this bill doesn't pass okay let's look at it this way if this bill does not pass these mcos and pbms are going to continue to uh, tighten the grip and they're going to reduce the dispensing fees they are going to reduce the acquisitions the mac rates are going to drop we are going to have a lot of problems because we can't pay our bills because we're not being reimbursed for the products that we're buying at a higher rate than what we're being reimbursed for. So the corner drugstore is going to shut down if they can't pay their bills. So so being able to say no to a below acquisition cost claim will allow them to not have to accept 
losses, which will allow them to concentrate on the correct payments on the claims that they are getting paid for. And that's why Representative Feigenholtz, which has been our knight in shining armor pushing this bill through, called this bill the Main Street Pharmacy Bill. And it's going to keep Main Street Pharmacy open because it's not the CVSs that are paying for Little League Baseball. It's the Main Street Pharmacies. Feigenholtz is, is our savior, and Representative Mary Flowers actually came in. She says we're talking about people's lives here. We need the pharmacists. We do not need the middlemen. They are not accountable to anyone, and that's where we stand right now, is trying to push the issue that PBMs, are, they're, they're just in it for the bottom line. They, they tout that they're in it for the patient, and they're pushing the MCOs so that they can better a patient's health and increase outcomes. But when it comes down to it, it's all about the bottom line. And you're exactly right. And I think where we've looked is specifically with one PBM in particular, when we look at CVS Caremark, you know, we've talked about in testimony throughout the last year that they closed pharmacies in the Chicago area and touting Medicaid reimbursements is one of the reasons why they closed those stores. And they're reimbursing their own pharmacies at different rates through the PBMs than they are other pharmacies. And through Caremark, they're actually, you know, they're, they're the processor for a majority of of these managed Medicaid plans. So they kind of set the stage and run the table when it comes to this operation of this program. And then at the same time, and we provided evidence to this, not only what's going on in other states, but that it's actually going on here in Illinois, that CVS is sending out letters to pharmacies saying, are you being hurt by underwater reimbursements? You know, we could help you out with that by buying your practice. This is a predatory practice that is utilizing the tax dollars of our citizens of our state and misusing the public trust to gain their bottom line. Yeah, it's kind of funny how the same guy who gets to set the price standard is the same guy who gets to be your biggest competitor and try to buy you out when he runs you out of business. So it's not exactly a fair playing field. And and the worst part about it is the community pharmacist, they don't have a leg to stand on and, and, and they can't negotiate these contracts to begin with. So that's why these bills are so important is to protect those pharmacists that don't have the right to go and fight for themselves individually. So that's why the state has to have some sort. You know, it's been brought up, Garth, that it's it's regulating business and, and it's something that the government should stay out of because it's 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 fair business and fair trade. But but this isn't fair trade, is it? This is this is a vertically integrated business structure that has been allowed to monopolize the business structure itself. And it's it's not allowing for the regular uh, business to play out where support comes from, you know, the sales and, and it drives the contracts the way it should be. This isn't that. This is a monopoly. This is not negotiations. This is take it or leave it type of business. And this is why government does need to step in, right? I completely agree with that because as we've discussed in other forums that the pharmacy benefit managers are not regulated to the extent that any other co- component of healthcare or any of its ancillary components are. And when it comes to the contracting, as you said, it's take it or leave it. And one of the interesting elements of this managed Medicaid contracting is that pharmacists, these contracts weren't separated out and should have been um, as, as they were for the MCOs. The MCO contracts for most other providers were completely separate new contracts. And even though the PBMs are a subcontractor of the MCOs, they utilized a lot of their existing national contracts to enroll pharmacies. And a lot of pharmacies were automatically put into this program without pharmacies being able to make the operational decision what they wanted to do for their practice and for their access for their patients. Medicaid is a voluntary program, whether it's fee-for-service or managed care. And right now in Illinois, it is not a voluntary program. It's a hostage situation. Pharmacies have a gun to their head to fill these scripts underwater, regardless of how it's going to impact their pharmacies, and it's going to be to the degradation of access for patients in, in the state. Well, I sure hope that we can get this great support that we had in the House. I hope we can continue the train and keep it moving so that the Senate can hear our story and get the same support that we had in the House, because it's important that this bill passes so that the small town pharmacies can stay open and we have rural access to pharmacies, because without this bill, take it from Garth and I both, 
we will lose access to pharmacies across this state because the MCOs and the PBMs who have no oversight in this state will be able to take matters into their own hands and run us out of business and buy up the pharmacies, and there's going to be no uh, competition against them uh, in the short run down the future. So, so we need support for both of these bills. Garth, what can our listeners do today and tomorrow to help support these bills? Well, when we're talking about the managed Medicaid bill with House Bill 3479, we need our members reaching out to all of our senators, to their senators in particular, talking to them, explaining to them how this program is impacting their practice currently and how this bill will help keep their practice sustainable, predictable, and that access will be maintained for their constituents. And when it comes to House Bill 274, we need our members reaching out back to the House members, encourage them to support the bill, explain to them how this is going to expand access for women for preventative health services throughout the state, and looking at helping to address the issue of unplanned pregnancies in Illinois and being able to provide additional options for women to have the opportunity to have contraceptive services in Illinois and being able to have that provided by the medication expert, which is, of course, the pharmacist. So if you're a member of IPHA, you're going to get emails. Uh, we have farm flashes that come out regularly that have all this information in it. It's got the talking points for each of these bills. They'll have information on how to contact your legislator and, and which bill you need to contact which legislator for. If you are not a member and you're listening to this podcast, thank you for one thing, for uh, reaching out to get some great knowledge on Illinois pharmacy here. But but you can also go to IPHA.org on the internet internet and get the same information. It's all there. And if not, you can always call the IPHA Association office and and they'll gladly help you navigate the website to find that information as well. So I want to thank you to our listeners for supporting the show. Uh, Check back regularly to see new episodes as we will keep you updated on legislative matters happening around the state. You can find us on the internet at IPHA.org and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at IL Pharmacists. That's plural, IL Pharmacists. Follow us today to stay in the know. Garth, you have any final words to send us away? Well, no, I just want to thank everyone for supporting us during this legislative session. We would not have the successes that we're having this year if it wasn't for our members reaching out and educating our legislators. So keep it up. Absolutely. Keep it up. It's very surprising success that we've had, but not surprising when you think of all the support that we've got across this state. And we hope to build on that. So if uh, you're one of those listeners I mentioned before that's not a member, join today. Help us get that support growing and strengthen our numbers because we need your voice with ours. So that'll do it today for this episode of Illinois Farm Talk. Thank you, Garth. Thank you, Ben. Stay tuned for our next episode as the voice for pharmacy in Illinois brings you another edition of Illinois Farm Talk.